Okay, before we start the intro, can you please turn to tab 23 of that Google Sheet that I shared? I just have my player's handbook, haven't seen a Google Sheet. Well, it's okay, I'll, I'll share it again, it's fine. There you go. Uh, but uh, Trav, can you remember the rule about cell phone use at the table? One's down. Yeah. Okay, here it is. I'm looking for what, coffee and performance? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's on column double A. Ah, all right, advantage, here we go. Oh, well actually, you, you would, but remember, Pruitt drinks chai and Trav got him coffee, so it doesn't. It's... Right about that, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, gotta get something, gotta get something. All right, there's a uh, that magic table that we got, brand new magic table from Hammered Forest? Yeah. You get, a, you get advantage, but it's forced and hammer. Looks like we're doing metagaming again here on WebDM. Does there need to be more snark? So Jim, metagaming. Meta gaming. We did talk about this not too long ago. Things though that maybe we need to clarify. With the feedback we got from the show, maybe there's a couple things that were, were left unsaid. Mm -hmm. So why not return to it? I do think it's worthwhile. And this will be, I, we found out last night, our third uh, metagaming show. So I guess we have talked about it quite a, quite a number of times, or mm -hmm. you know, more than other topics. I mean, I've been online in, in the online RPG communities for a long time. And, and while I'm mostly a lurker and, and just sort of absorb things, I, I have noticed that a lot of the discussion around metagaming, from number one, driven by Dungeon Masters. And it's Dungeon Masters fretting, worrying, uh, trying to find ways to stop the scourge that's going on at their table. And I rarely see like players doing it. Although we did get some feedback from from, uh, from some people, uh, particularly from our patrons who were like, yeah, you know, in, in a game, the, the players do more sort of like, um, not, I hesitate to use the word like policing of metagaming, but, but just like making sure that everybody is uh, abiding by the table's preferred mode of play. When I looked uh, online, because most of the shows here, I, I do a, just a, what's, what are people saying about it online? It, it helps inform uh, the shows that we do. You know, Googling metagaming RPG, you get some really interesting links. Uh, Angry GM has a rather long <laughs> uh, article about it that's, uh, that's worth the read if you, you know, don't mind this style. And there were some videos on it. I know Colville has done a video on metagaming. Uh, I believe maybe Nerdarchy's probably done one as well. The other things that I saw were just dozens and dozens and dozens uh, of, of pieces of advice to game masters to say, like, you need to put a stop to this right now. This is abhorrent. You should not allow this. And furthermore, these are things, you know, you need to punish your players using in-character measures. But it rain and lightning outside, uh, <laughs> you need to punish your players for, uh, for metagaming using in-character measures. And this is something that's been a part of the hobby for a long time. The first edition DMG has recommendations for using in-character measures to punish out-of-player or out-of-character behavior. And as much as I like Gygax and, and, and love Dungeons and & Dragons and, and all that, that's a piece of rotten advice. Metagaming is, is a problem with your players, not with their characters. It doesn't need to be solved by an, an in-character uh, or in-game means. It deserves a conversation with the people at the table. Yeah. And, and some of the feedback that we got suggested that we were kind of passing the buck by saying, hey, you know, be nice to everyone, play nice, don't be a dick, and, and, and follow the social contract of your table, that, that we weren't exploring some of the options and, and some of the ways, you know, that, that metagaming could be approached from the table. We'd have to have a video that was like three or four hours long and m more than us, it needs to be at least four other people here. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it's it's such a different thing for every table that to make prescriptions for what you should do other than talk about it and be open and honest in your communication, just not something that we were trying to do. So we didn't really have a balanced discussion about metagaming. We were more trying to be a counterbalance to other forms of online advice that suggest punish your players. I don't know that I've ever encountered a player who was upset about metagaming. I have met players who want everyone at the table to be, have the same level of investment in, in creating and maintaining the fiction that you are creating as, as part of playing the game. And in that respect, everyone sort of comes to an unspoken agreement of this is acceptable for metagaming, this isn't. I've seen players who grapple with that moment of like, oh, I, I, I know what this monster's weakness is, or I know what I'm supposed to do, but you can see them hold back. 
because the people playing this game want to be immersed, <laughs> want to be a, a, a part of a story, a part of a, a, a narrative that they get a hand in creating. And the number of people out here who are trying to win the role-playing games and do things underhanded, devious, deceptive to make sure that they win, that they don't suffer failures or setbacks and their goals are accomplished. Mm -hmm. I think that while um, the damage they can do to a group, if not addressed, can be significant, they are not that many of them out there. To have the blanket advice for Dungeon Masters be punish your players for knowing that a troll is harmed by fire or, or something. That said, the basic message there is talk to your players. Talk to them before the game, during the game, after the game, whenever. Listen to them. Y you have tools available to address this uh, problem. Uh, do we need to stop, Travis, for the rain? No. I, I, it's it's going to okay. rain. Cool. It's going to rain. Shooting. All right. Keep shooting. All right. I mean, it's like 80% today, so yeah, it's no going to rain a lot. It's going to rain all day. There are tools for addressing this, but they are they're person-to-person tools, yeah. not, not like in-game in, in tools. But it does beg the question, and I, and I thought that we went through several examples of sort of like, here are some things that might be considered metagaming, here are the ways in which it could be a, potentially be a problem for some groups, as well as a commitment to, you know, to saying like, hey, hey groups, if having a firm line, having a, a well-defined line between in-character and out-of-character knowledge, and making sure that the actions your characters take are rooted in in-character knowledge, then that's something that the group is going to have to talk to each other, they're going to have to address it. It, it doesn't have to. You, this style of play can emerge from the collective actions of everyone at the table without talking about it. Mm -hmm. And while it can work out that way, it deserves, a, at the very least, a dungeon master going like, hey, don't sweat it too much. It, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I appreciate your commitment to, to finding in-character justifications for, for what's going on. But, you know, if you want to do something, do something. Yeah, like, you know, if you got a, you got a cleric in the party, everybody should talk about the fact of, in battle, if the cleric's like, how you doing? Right. That's a good example of, of a type of metagaming. I, I'm 59 of 73 hit points. Like, how yeah. is that, you know, yes, my character doesn't know how many hit points they have left. They also don't know any of their spells or abilities or anything that, that are not rooted in the game world, right? If, if that uh, 59 hit points down or whatever is a fighter, then they don't have an, a concept of, of their action surge. That's something that they can only use once a short rest, which is an ill-defined period of time in the game world. You're mm -hmm. going to tell me that your, your fighter knows about second wind and, and all these other things. That chances are they just fight. They do what they need to do in the yeah. situation. You, the player, are the ones making the decision when they use those abilities. Yeah. Different from spells because spells are rooted in the you know in, in the fiction of the world. Yeah. As a fighter, you just you, you can take a deep breath and, and hunker down in the yeah. fight, and mm -hmm. it's like okay, use second wind. Okay. Sure. Yeah. But again, we're back towards like why only once? Why can't we just take a couple of breathers or something? This is where the intersection of the rules and and the in-game uh, fiction that we're that, that gets created through play run into each other. And in those moments, the player has to navigate a whole range of options. What do I want my character to do? What do I want to do? Can I be uh, helpful to my teammates? Is, is what I'm going to do going to upset the dungeon master and, and, and cause a, us to all die or something? You know, there's a lot going on. Let's ease off on on like being really judgmental or, or trying to control why uh, players make certain decisions. That does not mean there's no such thing as bad metagaming. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that there's not metagaming that's disruptive to tables. But what we were trying to say is less like, let's talk, let's like list out all the bad metagaming and more just say, you are going to have to figure out for yourself what constitutes bad metagaming, what constitutes good metagaming, and have a conversation about that mm -hmm. with your group because Jim and Pruitt can't do that for you. We don't have the kind of time uh, and you wouldn't want us to anyway. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't like to micromanage. We like to right. keep things in the macro. Sure, and, sure. And uh, one that I notice in you know, playing a lot more games in the last couple of years. Yeah. But playing with newer players, when something happens in a scene and they're the only ones to witness or experience it, and then it comes back to the rest of the party, they understand that everybody listened to that, so everybody knows, but their player hasn't informed our players. Yeah. So we're all sitting there like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is you one know, of the, yeah, this is one of tell those, us? this is one of those instances where I would say something like the players can freely contribute to helping this player figure this out. Yeah. We are all playing the game together. Mm -hmm. We are all doing XYZ. But I would ask those players not present to not refer to their characters. 
yeah. to just help that player out. Maybe the the player by themselves is having to solve a riddle or something, or you know. And this happens a lot with say like rogue players, right? Like rogues are off on their own. They're sneaking and scouting ahead. They often find or discover the puzzles and traps and things like that that uh, <laughs> that the party is trying to avoid. Travis found a trap. Or Travis found a trap and <laughs> is uh, attempting to disarm them to gain information about them to bring back to the party. And there's nothing particular about the rogue archetype that suggests it should be played by advanced players, right? Who right. know how to do all that. So what, like, what in the world are you doing? Sticking a, a player who le has less experience, doesn't really know the ins and outs of the game that well, in a situation by themselves, and then telling them, oh yeah, all your friends over here, all these people who are participating with you, you cannot talk to them to solve this problem. Because they're not there. Well, their characters aren't there. But they are here at this table, and there's no, there's nothing wrong with letting everyone participate in at least the planning, the meta game, right? The portion that is not rooted down here in the fiction, but is, is us around a table playing. Why wouldn't you not have us all in on this conversation? And then when it comes time for it, the player who is, whose character is alone says, well, I want to do this. And then they do that. And then when they get to the other the characters, then they explain what was going on. We're not over here going like, oh yeah, well my wizard doesn't know anything about what's going on and they're going to teleport over there and help you. Like that's a, that's a style of metagaming yeah. that I would ask that player to go, well, why would you think that? What makes you think you It's been too long. <laughs> sure. Now, if the player is a super paranoid, you know, if that wizard is a hyper paranoid kind of, uh, you know, character, or they have a special bond with the character that's off by themselves, then that seems like a sufficient justification. I hope our viewers see what we mean by this, is that all of these instances, is this good metagaming, is this bad metagaming, and, and really the criteria there should be, is it disruptive, or does it uphold what we want to get out of the game? And that could be genre conventions that you want to stick to, you know, a don't split the party kind of thing. Maybe this character was, you know, forcibly split from the party. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be what to do about table talk and, and, and all sorts of things. And, and so for us to be like, this is always good, this is always bad, is there's going to be groups up there who are like, no, it's not. We, we do it this way and it's mm -hmm. perfectly fine. So that's why we didn't make any pronouncements from on high about what was and wasn't good yeah. uh, metagame. It doesn't mean we can't talk about it, you know, it, now, that's the whole point. Now, Jim, you yeah. saying that made me think of something. What you got? What you got? Isn't the idea of not splitting the party just a big old bit of metagaming? Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. Mm -hmm. you're remembering all those times from past adventures yep. that characters went off on their own. Uh -huh. And so it's always like, don't split the party, whatever you do. Yeah. You're now metagaming. You're now metagaming, yeah. You know? and, and People split the party all the time. Oh, sure. Like, it literally happens all the time. All the time. Half the time you wouldn't be able to do the things you need to do sure. unless you split the party. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, it's a serious convention in Doctor Who. Yes. I mean, he encourages them, don't go off alone, because he wants them to go off on their own. Right, right, Because he right. needs them to get into trouble yes. so he can find out who's yeah, behind the thing same and same. save the yeah, day. Yeah. Yeah, they can learn something about themselves. Yeah, you got to have some bait out there. That's what I'm sure, saying. Sure, sometimes you do need to have bait. That's what henchmen and hirelings are for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, pay my hazard pick. <laughs> Extra ten percent for this one, boys. <laughs> Wink. But I understand where where some of the the feedback was coming from. That yeah. they're they're looking for us to dig in a bit more about you know the different types of of metagaming and what constitutes what. So I do think for me the criteria is good metagaming upholds the group's commitment to the type of game they want to play. If the type of game they're wanting to play is a beer and pretzels, silly dungeon basher, where what the characters know and what the characters don't know is not that relevant, and we're here to cut loose after a long week of BS work, yep. kill some monsters, hang out with friends, and just do something fun for a couple of hours, then why are you making a big deal out of this? Like, you know, like the, it seems as if the, if this is what the group has decided, how they want mm -hmm. to play, how they've approached it, what they want to do, how they interact with the ta the world and each other and everything, just roll with it, right? Like, there's a lot of funny, <laughs> silly, stupid things you can do when you just, like, don't care about in-character versus out-of-character mm -hmm. uh, knowledge, you know? Yeah, one way to do that is to, if you've never done it, have a game where you play yourselves... Show, they yeah, get yeah. transported to the D&D world. To the D&D world, oh, And yeah, then yeah. metagame the fuck out of that game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually gonna be like, where were we when this happened? We were on our way to D&D. So that means we have our books with us. Here's books. Pull out the monster manual. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. This is how we need to fight this monster. Yeah. You know? You can like, see the matrix. Like, you, you can see the matrix. You, yeah, you are, in, right. in that case, <laughs> you would be a wizard. Yeah. You have these books of lore that tell you all of the magic in the world. Oh, yeah. That's a way to I mean, go ahead and just steep yourself just in it. Just steep yourself in it, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And the opposite is true, right? Like, let's say you're playing a horror RPG. It's difficult 
to get players to feel the same sense of fear and dread and, and apprehension and tension that their characters are experiencing yeah. in these kind of games. Like the, the golden moment for a horror RPG GM or RPG GM is <laughs> to have their character, sorry, have the players be frightened. Yeah. To have the players be scared. You evoked those emotions basically, and, and the, what you've done is, is, is you know, it's really fun. It's special, but it doesn't happen a lot. And so maybe you have a metagame commitment to avoiding certain types of behaviors that are are appropriate for other games. We're going to rush headlong into the monster and attack them, uh, and, and and you know that's just what we do because we're playing a you know, D&D or another kind of game where confrontation with monsters is, is uh, on the table. Yeah. Or, but if you're playing like Cthulhu or, or some other kind of game where the monsters are monstrous and, and you have to be careful and you have to like think about how you're going to approach them and just being near them is inimical to your life and, and you should just stay away as much as possible, then you maybe have that metagame commitment to like, let's play people who are not steeped in the supernatural, who do not know what this creature is that's emerging from the corner of the room. We don't know what this other invisible flying thing is that's going to cart us off to the dark between the stars. Like, we're just committed to playing sort of mundane, normal people. That's a metagame commitment. As much as don't split the party, as much as we're not here to take this too seriously, mm -hmm. those are things that either emerge because they just, you know, group dynamics and, I don't know, a sociologist. But, you know, I've played a lot of D&D &D and, and <laughs> you see it happen, yeah. right? Or it can be an explicit, hey guys, like if I'm running a con game, I might have just a, a you know, a table rules printed up that, are, that might include something about metagaming and what I expect and what I don't. But, you know, there are guidelines, you know, they're, they're not, even then, they're not like hard and fast uh, rules for me. So good metagaming is just, it, it happens, it's possible. Bad metagaming is more like, you know, don't read the adventure and, yeah. and expect to, to deceive the rest of the players and DM about it and yeah. act on that information. Like, let's say this is, a, this is a common scenario and it's happened to me. I've played part of the adventure or I've run part of an adventure and get invited to another group that's playing the adventure as well. To me, the first thing that I'm going to say is like, oh, I've run part of that. Or, yeah, let them know. You know, or I played through this part of it as a one shot, or or a, with a game that you know, a group that that didn't uh, didn't quite make it, or something. Like, why wouldn't you? And some of the feedback that we got that was like, oh, hey, what about this? Uh, you know, they have a player who's read the adventure and they're they're trying to like justify their actions. They they want to maintain the fiction. They don't want to break that fourth wall in terms of like having their character do something that's inappropriate. But they are kind of asking questions and doing things in a manner that suggests they know what they want to do because they know what the adventure has and now they're looking for justification. Yeah, when you get to a scene, you only get one clue and then you ask the three exact questions that you need to have that you need answered to have. Yeah. right off the bat. And I, I find that to be a case of, when I, when I look at that example, uh, my first thought is like, why is that player being so underhanded? Like that's the problem there, is that you have a player who has relevant information that, that they've played this game before. They know yeah. these NPCs, yeah. they know the secrets already. Why didn't they disclose that at the beginning? That's the problem, not the metagaming. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> who cares at right, that right. point? Why do I have someone who's at my table lying to me yeah. that won't just be like honest? There's things you can do if you have a player who's played the adventure before. You can get around that, you know? Yeah, you can, but they, they should probably like stick to the back at least for the parts that they know. Sure. Sure, right. Don't, don't offer. Don't be the one to offer the information. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, that's usually what I do. Is I usually just like, well, I, I've run this part of the adventure before, so I'll be here for the for when you need me, but I'm not going to take the lead. I'm in the back, um, and I'll let the people who haven't played this yet, who yeah. it's new, and they can anyway. Yeah. One t one time when I was 12, uh, I was home from school on Channel Three, which was the ABC channel out of Shreveport. I mm. watched Jeopardy, and then it came on again at four o'clock on our ABC channel. And so I was watching it again, not knowing that it was the same show. And then it was right. like, oh. And so then I was just like, I'm going to see how many of the answers I can remember. Right. And so as it's going, I'm just firing answers <laughs> off. And then my cousin walks in and she's like, oh, you're watching Jeopardy. I love this show. And I'm just like answering question after question. And she's like, oh, my God, you're really smart. And I look at her. I'm like. Yeah, this came on an hour ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but it was a fun moment to mess with her for a minute where I'm just like stone faced, just firing, firing answers off. off. Answers. It's like, yeah. I get that you want to feel like you know it, yeah. but no, don't, yeah. don't, don't act like you know it just you're, because you read it. To me, it's the fun of discovery is, is, 
is a powerful driver for a game uh, like an RPG because that emergent quality to RPGs, the, the, the unpredictability, the I don't know what's going to happen, we're all going to sit down here and, and solve the problems and give our input and, and react to what the dungeon master is doing and vice versa and all these things and like out of that is going to you're gonna get surprised, something kind of unexpected is going to happen, you don't know what's going on. To me it speaks to a something going on in the player that they feel the need to have advanced knowledge of that, to navigate that situation. Either they've had DMs who've just been overly punitive and if they make the wrong choice they just they have their characters taken away from them or something something that the player doesn't you know really doesn't want or mm. they've had DMs who who don't give out enough information and they feel like well I, I just can't make decisions I don't know what's going on so maybe they feel the need to 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 look up the answers and yet th we've now entered a, a, a mindset where it's like there's no answers here there's not there's not a way to win this game. Like, what is it that's happening that makes you think not telling us you've played this before is a good idea? That's a very specific example, but but it was one that was brought to my attention, you know, by people who'd seen the video and mm -hmm. were sort of curious about uh, about how we would handle that. If the rest of the group does not want you to act on out of character information, that they're committed to having an immersive in character experience, and you're over here going like, yeah, I'm just going to use a bunch of out of character information to make decisions for my character, then that's probably bad metagaming. You probably should stop and, yeah. and don't be surprised if your group approaches you and says hey you know we really just it's it's not fun it makes the game unfun for us right uh, when, when we play that way uh, so, so yeah so another place uh, in game in play or metagaming can kind of get out of hand yeah we talked about it a little bit at the end of the video right but, right last video but yeah, PvP yeah. PvP when, when it comes down to player versus player whatever the reason what's important for a DM to remember when 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 you get to this point? Yeah, well, we are assuming here that the PV, that PvP is the goal and that both players are okay with that. Yeah. There are a lot of players who do not like PvP situations, whether it's direct combat or like using uh, certain abilities and spells and the like uh, between players. Again, this is something that you would probably talk about in a session zero or a pregame, or everybody would just sort of have a general commitment to not you know, no PvP. But if it happens, and I've been in groups where there's been PvP for a variety of reasons, some of it magically compelled, some of it because the goals of the characters were at odds, came to blows. Uh, and in those moments, as I said, as we said at the end of the, the last video in the, the stinger uh, bit, that those are the times when I really will step in and be like, I need you to justify why you are doing a certain thing. I need you to, to tell me in character what your character's justification for this is, particularly if it looks like the players are attempting to use their their human real world knowledge in order to gain an advantage in, in this particular contest. In those moments, the DM is a neutral referee. You owe it to both of the players or however many are in the situation to, to arbitrate any disputes fairly and to make sure that the, the playing field is as even as possible as the players go at each other or attempt mm -hmm. to undermine each other or whatever it is. And, and maybe this is uh, you know, an entire campaign Right, you can imagine a game of something like uh, Song of Ice and Fire, the the Green Ronin um, RPG that you know you create a house and there's intrigue between the houses, an intra house and inter house, and all these kinds of things, and and you might have a whole campaign where where the players are forming alliances against one another all the time, or or between each other, and secrets kept from other players, secrets kept from even maybe the DM. Right, that, that that are waiting to be revealed uh, uh, to the to the game's referee, are are all valid ways to play. Yeah, and if that's the kind of game you're going for, that's no different than you saying like, all right, we're playing a horror RPG. Let's make characters who are not familiar with the supernatural. Let's make characters who do not know all the Cthulhu stuff that that I know because I've been reading it for forever. You know, we're making characters that have no idea that vampires and werewolves exist, and this is that we're going to play through they are dis their discovery of that situation. I don't see it any different than that and just saying like, yeah, this is a game of intrigue and spies and manipulation and you are going to have secrets from each other. You might have them from me, the dungeon master. We need to respect that. Don't go reading people's notes. Uh, I imagine now it's a lot easier to do that kind of game with texting and online, you know, like private message forums, things like that. Yeah. Have to pass physical notes that you need to keep hidden. That you others. that you then have to eat because you you're the type of person that eats notes because you don't want people to see them. Listen, when your commitment to keeping secrets is such that you eat the note the dungeon master has sent you, I will award extra XP for that. There is a question there 
uh, in, in PvP combat that, that deserves a little bit of discussion. It's not necessarily related to metagaming, but it is, uh, it, it, it can. And that's the use of skills between players. Like, yeah. what do you do when there is a really charismatic, persuasive character and a non-charismatic, persuasive character and they have their, their budding hits? And they're they're just kind of you know uh, we, you know we don't we can't agree on this we can't reach uh, a compromise the the, per, the charismatic persuasive woman wants to use that ability their character is persuasive and likable and able to make compromises and all this other stuff and other character isn't like do you let them roll dice against each other do you let them just role play it out entirely I don't have the right answer to this folks I I, I don't uh, it, it's going to be different for everybody and and some groups might not uh, mind having skills used on their characters when it's player versus player. Um, you know, that, to me that then begs the question of like, can NPCs do that to you? Mm -hmm. You know, what happens when an NPC tries to convince you of something? Um, my personal preference is that the decisions about what the character's gonna do should always fall to the player unless there is some sort of like significant external factor, magic. Possession, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, but in that scenario where you have the very charismatic player and the non-charismatic player has seen, has seen their 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 character do those things, lie to people, you be silver tongue, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. now it turns on them. Sure. Like, how, how do those skills still work? Right? Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, like that's that's the question to ask. If you know that they can do that, again, back to Doctor, the Doctor always lies, but they still listen to him. But they still listen to him, right? sure. Even yeah, though yeah. they know he lies to people all the time, yeah. even to them, yeah. they still listen to him because it's charisma. So it's like, ah, yeah, they sure know. do. And and, and I, I I think to me, like we all know people, or maybe we do, uh, that are charismatic and persuasive and whatever. But that doesn't mean every time you talk to them that you leave doing exactly what you wanted them to do right. or what they wanted you to do. Like this is why you know. Skills are not magic, they're not a compulsion. A lot of DMs use those social skills as a shorthand to just sort of get through a scene. All right, let's, let's roll the dice and see what happens. But I, I really am of the opinion that it's like, yeah, that character may be persuasive. And in this argument, they might may be the better arguer, they might make a better argument, they might have a point. But you can't tell this other player what to do if, if that uncharismatic, unsocially adept uh, character doesn't want to do it, then mm -hmm. they don't. They just ignore your argument. You know, it's the same yeah. way with an NPC might. You can rock a 30 persuasion. Doesn't mean the king's gonna make you the prince and yeah. give you all the treasury. Yeah, I would say, I would say, you know what a good real world example of that is, is yeah. uh, right at the, at, at the introduction of television, you had the Nixon oh, Kennedy the Nixon debate. Kennedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. listened to the listen to it on the radio. We're like, oh, Nixon won. But you watch him on TV, and Kennedy is so much more charismatic in what he in what he's saying. Everybody who watched TV, oh, Kennedy won. Yeah, it doesn't look like a melting wax figure. He doesn't look like a well, <laughs> but it's all about right. yes. perception yeah, and and reality. Yeah. If you just listen to the data, it's one thing. But if you actually see it's the data being presented, you see why you need high charisma characters. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. And and we 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 mentioned this part in in uh, you know discussion of metagaming because PvP combat is one of those things where like you might have a character who's never used an ability or a spell before mm -hmm. and in that PvP scenario the other player knows they possess it but the character's never seen it so they might say like oh well I'm you know I'm gonna cast freedom of movement on myself because I know so-and-so's got a you know a bunch of wicked restriction based magic that they've never used but they talked about maybe the talked table. yeah yeah and so that those are situations where I might be like well why would your character think that they've never seen this other character do anything like that why drink uh you know a, a potion of fire resistance you know that you haven't seen this other character use fire magic yet those are situations where i might step in and ask that the the player like hey give me some thought why is this uh why are you doing this yeah yeah, yeah and that kind of dovetails into i guess sort of the last thing player secrets so the secrets yeah man should a player keep a secret from a dm i mean if the dm is supposed to be the arbiter of the rules and kind of the godlike oh, figure yeah, yeah. right and they yeah. know all yeah should players conspire and keep secrets from the DM? You know, I think that it's probably okay. I mean, number one, at some point you are going to have to tell the DM. If you want something to happen in the game, the, the dungeon master or game master, whoever, is going to need to know. But you don't need to, like, tip your hat too early, particularly if you are worried that you have a DM that metagames. <laughs> you, you know, that, that it's like, well, you, you always, no matter what we do, seem to have the perfect counter to it. I'm playing this close to the vest until... It's until it's time to, to enter it into play. But even then, that's a scenario or a situation where I might just ask the dungeon master, like, hey, it, it really seems like you're 
the villains in the in the in the game know exactly what we're doing all the time, mm -hmm. and it doesn't look like it has an in-game rationale, right? You know, particularly if you've taken steps to try to mitigate some of the ways that a uh, you know an enemy could potentially spy on you, and, and yet still they have the, the knowledge. Talk to the DM, ask them what's up, why are they doing that? Maybe they're doing it because they want to challenge you, and and in order to challenge you, they have to metagame. Many DMs find themselves in that position where they've got players who are good at making characters and make their, you know, power gamers or optimizers or whoever, and um, metagaming on the DM's part is how they challenge those players that want to be challenged in that way. And that seems perfectly fine. In that situation, maybe you would keep secrets from the DM and it would just be understood that players will be keeping secrets from me and once they tell me, that's okay, but they, we trust that whatever they're doing in secret they're still obeying the rules of the game. They're still playing by the rules. They're still playing fairly. That's m what the important part is. Uh, yeah, situation. well, they'll still have to present their secret, like you said, and it will more than likely have to fit within the rules to be presented at the table, Sure, right? yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so one would hope. One um, would hope. But, you know, there's other stuff. Players keeping secrets from each other, a lot of that is just like, hey, respect. That happens. Yeah, that right. happens all the time. I mean, there's some games where it's like literally the basis of the game. Oh, it's keeping like secrets. Call of them. Cthulhu? Oh my yeah. God, so many people's characters, they're nothing but secret right up until the very end. You're like, I'm sorry, you made a deal with the fucking devil? Yeah. That's why you've been, you know, right. whatever this whole time? And that's great. Like, I yeah. love that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, that, those kinds of games where the players are scheming against each other and, and keeping things from each other and, and have their ulterior motives and, and together as a group but maybe not all together all the time mm -hmm. you know like one of those where they're not they're not boon companions for life who, who form deep bonds of friendship on the road to adventure they're just mercenaries and whoever and, and temporary alliances are, are, are a thing um, then yeah you you'd probably keep secrets from them and so in those situations it's up to the DM to be like hey please respect the secrets that that other you know that the other uh, characters have, even if you were present at the table when the secret was revealed, right? You know, uh, but especially if the DM and the player go off and have like a side scene or or you know whatever you know mm -hmm. a solo game we used to call them. Or if that player decides to confide in you the secret that they have, yes, I don't go blurting that at the table. You know, right. I mean, like, well, you told me, I figured, you know, like, yeah, no, yeah. maybe they just wanted to tell you because sometimes secrets are fun to tell. That's why we like telling them and keeping sure, them. Sure, Absol absolutely. A lot of people seem to like having a character with secrets. They get revealed over the course of the game. I know if you're a fan of Critical Role that a lot of the appeal of some of the players and the characters there is that they took, put a lot of attention into the, you know, sort of what their characters are like and what their backstories are like. And some of it comes out in play, some of it doesn't, but like the appeal of it is, is getting to watch and be like, oh, that's why Caleb acts this way or whatever. You know? mm -hmm. um, there are players who want to replicate that experience in their home games. And Wait, why, why does Caleb act that way? I don't know. I stopped watching after episode Shit. 11 of the new season because <laughs> I just don't have that kind of time. Yeah, I dropped off at like 14, I think. Right. But um, I know that something happened and there were a lot of people talking about it. Everything we've talked about here, just like everything we talked about in the most recent uh, metagaming video, has its basis in the relationships of the people at the, par uh, at the table to each other. And, and if you're treating each other as human beings and being respectful and, 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 and mm -hmm. talking to each other, then a lot of these, a lot of the bad metagaming that sometimes you don't know you don't want it till it happens. <laughs> and you're like, wait a second, that's, that's, not, you know, that's not for me. It's easier to figure that out if you, if you just talk about it in the beginning. Even if it's just a quick like, hey guys, I'm not super big on you guys avoiding metagaming. Um, just play your characters like you like you would, and if there's any cases we need to talk about, we'll discuss them quickly and, and whatever. That's what I tell people when they start a game in one of my campaigns. Mm -hmm. Don't sweat it. I'm not gonna come down on hard on it. If something if it becomes a problem, we will talk about it then. Yeah. And I literally have never had a problem with that. Doesn't have to be a problem. Doesn't have to, no. For the Web DM podcast and other exclusive content, please check out the Web DM Patreon. And don't forget to subscribe to the Web DM channel over on Twitch, where we play three wild and crazy games every week Starward Bound, Unearthly Twilights, and Land Between Two Rivers. Those games are also archived on our second YouTube channel, Web DM Plays, so be sure to check that out and subscribe as well. Now, we're going to teach you about the birds and the bees, because here comes the stinger. <laughs> There we go. Now, what I want to do is watch the intro from the last metagaming show. 
if only to see if we can go another layer deep. Part of me wants to put Trevor on the table too. Yeah, I think I think the next time Travis needs to be here. I think the next time you need to be at the table. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we, I, I think we can kind of do the same thing where I'm the DM, and you're you're uh, you're playing me, but uh, 